Hey, this is Pat Flynn from Fiddlehead, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new scene. We're back. We're back again twice in a week. And I've got Josh Brigham back with me in the guest co-host chair. Josh, how's it going? It's going very well. And I have to say, I'm thrilled to be here uh, to talk to you in particular about this band today. Yes, we have a great episode for you today. We have spoken to Sam Boiteri from Greet Death. They have just come out with a new EP new low on death wish inc check that out if you haven't their 2019 lp new hell is unbelievably good check that out you know what i haven't listened to the first album dixie land yet that came out in 2017 i'm actually like saving it you know i'm like saving it for a special occasion have you heard that one yet josh I, dude i like i don't want to like give away too much but new hell i just can't stop listening to Right. And that's not the one. I mean, it's not the newest release, but it's new to me. So I, I just can't stop. Yeah, I can't get off New Hell. It's so good. And Josh, I was talking to you about this. When I hear it, I'm like, oh, man, I should have written this. And I love when that happens because it just means I'm so in tune with it. And it's like, it's a great feeling. Oh, Keith, I wish I had written those songs. They're, like, they are freaking fantastic songs. They're, yeah, I'm so excited about the fact that you sent me that song. Or you sent me the song, You're Gonna Hate What You've Done, at like 10 o'clock at night one night. And we're just like, you gotta listen to this. And I couldn't stop listening to it. I listened to it for the next, I didn't even get to the rest, of, I didn't get to the rest of the record. I listened to that song for an hour and a half just on repeat and was just like whoa i love this so when you say you wish you wrote it i get it (laughs) i i it's so weird i had the same exact experience i listened to it and the first time i heard it i listened to it four times in a row and didn't even get to the rest of the album because i got so fixated on it and i love that you had a, a similar experience And Josh, that's why I love that you're here co-hosting this episode with me, because I feel like we are equally enthusiastic about this band. We are definitely equally enthusiastic about this band. I'm I'm just going to go ahead and throw my full endorsement on this and say, if you haven't listened to it, fucking listen to it. Holy shit. It's, It's got a lot. It's got a lot going on there. It hits on multiple freaking levels. And you guys, uh, like, I just... I'm excited to hear what he has to say about uh, uh, just about their band. <laughs> yeah, and that's coming up soon. And we cover it all. The formation of the band, their evolution and sound over the years, and a bunch of other stuff. And we talk a lot about Twitch. You know I love that. And that's all I'm going to say because I don't want to spoil it for you. So, And just quickly, if you want to support the new scene, the two best ways to do that are purchasing a t-shirt or the long sleeve. They're available at Death Wish Inc. Go over there to the store and search the new scene, and you'll see the nice selection of shirts and Apple Podcast and Spotify reviews. If you haven't submitted a five-star review through one of those applications, do it. It helps us out a lot. And if you write a nice review on Apple Podcasts, I'll read it on the air. And of course, support Iodine Recordings, wonderful label, great bands, excellent merch. Check out their Instagram iodine recordings for all the latest updates and you can also check them out online at iodinerecords.com so we appreciate your support you make this show possible so you know what we're gonna jump right into the interview but make sure you check back in with me and josh after the interview because hopes fall just played a full satellite years set at i matter festival in new york over this past weekend i want to ask josh about that Uh, We want to talk more about how we love Greet Death and catch up with each other. And uh, yeah, so check back in with us at segment three. But right now, we are going to speak to Sam Boyteri of Greet Death. Enjoy. We're here now with Sam Boyteri. Sam, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. 
Absolutely, Sam. It's wonderful to have you here. You know, I have to say, I have been very gripped by your band, Greet Death, as of lately. I love everything that I hear from the first moment that I heard it, and I want to learn about you, and I want to learn about the band. But before we jump into all of that, Sam, let me first ask you, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, just finished that Obi-Wan series. It was pretty good. Is it worth I watching? Now, I watched, what's the one with the, the, the child? What is Mandalorian. It? The man- yeah, I haven't, seen all, I've, I haven't seen all of that. Mandalorian, I really like. Um, Boba Fett, I skipped because the reviews were not great. But how's Obi-Wan? Yeah, it was really good. It's only six episodes, so it's like not a big investment, you know? But yeah, it was fun. Only six episodes? I'm in. I'll do it. I'm going to watch it. That's like an afternoon if you're me and you just binge stuff and you're yeah. not healthy about it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I first discovered Greet Death. Death Wish posted the first single, I Hate Everything. And I have to say, it's been a while since I've been so gripped by a song and by a band. And, you know, when I am so gripped by a song and a band, I worry about that band. Are you okay, Sam? Is everything going okay? (laughs) I think we're okay. Uh, I don't know. Just day by day, uh, working working our shitty jobs, trying to get through it, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) Now, yeah, researching the band, I've I've seen that you've worked... uh, a number of shitty jobs over the years to to get by. Are, are you still doing that now? Where are you working these days? Yeah, I was I uh, I was just washing dishes for a couple months in between tours, uh, which I just had my last day because we're about to leave again. But uh, and you know, I say shitty, but you do what you got to do. It's just you know, there's something so it's just monotonous, you know, to go do the do that stuff every day, and you got to do it. There's no way around it. But uh, I think that's just something that kind of. Uh, bogs you down you know me at least i don't know if everybody's like that yeah it makes sense i mean you do what you do to be able to do what you want to do i do the same thing i work my nine to five and then i shut all that shit off and then i come and do this yep exactly so you grew up in michigan yes yeah yep where in michigan small town called davisburg it's nobody people in michigan don't even know where that is but it's near a place called holly uh it's it's like 30 minutes from Flint, an hour from Detroit, east side. Yeah, Michigan is like its own world. I did a tour of Michigan a couple years ago for my day job, and I went to various places, Grand Rapids, Detroit, Ann Arbor, I guess the big cities in Michigan, but driving around and seeing the suburbs and everything, um, it was like, it's really like its own world. It's kind of neat. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm very fond of it. Um, I'm always going to love where I'm from, uh, in a way. And a lot of musicians skip it, honestly. I, you know, they get a lot of tours, but I know people do skip it because you kind of got to go up a little bit, I guess. I don't, yeah. So, but no, it it, it was a great place to grow up. There's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of major cities like Grand Rapids, Detroit, uh, Ann Arbor. You're never like very far away from, from a city, which I think for us was good because we could always go somewhere and play and it wasn't like a crazy drive. Do you have any thoughts of leaving ever, like any big city dreams or that type of thing? Well, I, I I actually live in Chicago now. That's where I'm talking to you from. So I guess, yeah, <laughs> I guess, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been living in Chicago for like four years, uh, which I'd still like to live many other places. But for now, this is where I am. And the rest of the band still lives in Michigan. So what made you want to get out of Michigan and head to Chicago? Honestly, work. Um, I was working at a pizza job for like six years when I was in Michigan and I was just kind of ready to, it wasn't, we were trying to do more touring and I was looking for a job that would maybe be more conducive to me taking a lot of time off. And I was also looking to move out of my parents' house, but it was hard for me to find any jobs that, I mean, I probably could have if I would have looked hard enough, but I had friends in Chicago that were like, Hey, come out here. We'll hook you up with a, like a courier job and you can get started. Um, and it sounded exciting and different, uh, scary, but yeah, I just, I did it. I drove four hours to Chicago one day to do a 15 minute interview. And then I drove home after that four hours. And, uh, then I came back a month later, I started subleasing an apartment for like two months and it was before a tour. So I was living in somebody's bedroom with a bunch of people I didn't know. Uh, they were very nice. Um, it was kind of like an artist studio. So it was pretty cool, honestly, but I was almost just, uh, you know, I was just posted up in a bedroom with a cat that wasn't mine with a, <laughs> with a space heater during the winter. 
just waiting to go on tour. Uh, yeah. And it was great. So I don't know. And then I eventually got my own place, but, uh, yeah, that's how I ended up out here. What kind of messenger job was it? Bike messenger, driving messenger? Well, I had a car at the time, so I w- it was driving, which is crazy, but that's how I learned how to get around Chicago was driving a minivan uh, in the loop and around the West Loop and whatever, just delivering groceries. But I actually quit there after like four months or five months because I, I started working for a, uh, like an online music retailer. So it was like an office job. And uh, yeah, then I was there until about two months ago. Uh, I quit doing that because I got tired of it. And yeah, I just got like a job washing dishes before this tour coming up to make some money. Yeah, whatever you can do between tours to make things happen, right? Right. So talk about your history with music. Have you always loved it your whole life? Is it something you got into later? Um, it's funny because as a kid, I didn't like I I didn't listen to music for a long time. My parents were big, like kind of Beatles who uh, my dad really liked a lot of prog rock. My dad's in a band, so that's kind of how I got introduced to music. He played bass, and he still does with his friends. Um, so I was always going over to their house in Wyandotte, which is a suburb of Detroit, and they had like a studio, and I would just watch them play and bang on some drums and whatever. They would let me do that. And eventually, I started taking his like cheap trick CDs on the bus, and you know, I had a Walkman like a CD player. So anything my parents were listening to, I would just take on the bus and listen to, or I even had like a CD of my dad's band that I would listen to um, on the bus. But uh, I really didn't have like much taste of my own until like sixth or seventh grade when, um, when my friends would show me like, uh, you know, like Blink-182 or Green Day. uh, So a lot of very like a pop punk introduction was when I actually started um, to have my own taste, I think. That's interesting. I really got interested in music as well. I guess the alternative boom was happening and Green Day's Dookie had just come out. So yeah. that was like a huge thing. What what Green Day and Blink records did you come in on? I'm interested in this. Well, it's funny because when I was in like second grade, um, American Idiot was like the big thing, you know, but my parents probably weren't going to let, let me listen to it. Um, the people that were listening to that were like the the edgier kids, you know, <laughs> or just my parents weren't like really that strict, but like, you know, my mom liked to try to control what I did for a while. And then she, she chilled out. But, um, so I, I didn't really get to listen to that, but a couple years later, or, you know, once I was in like sixth and seventh grade, Logan showed me Enema of the state. And then we started playing covers of that in his basement. At that point, he had been playing guitar for a couple of years and I started playing bass because of my dad. And cause you know, if my friend's playing guitar, well, I'm going to play bass at the time. So that record was really big. And then uh, Dookie for sure. I used to mow my lawn and listen to Dookie. (laughs) So, um, and then like Dead Kennedys, uh, Metallica, you know, all these kind of some classic, more classic bands. We would do like covers in our friend Zach's garage and bedroom. And we would just do like Metallica and Dead Kennedys songs and uh, stuff like that. So so yeah. you weren't you weren't allowed to listen to American Idiot? That's a pretty innocuous album, I feel like. I don't know. I don't it wasn't like a conversation I ever had with my mom, but I kind of just knew like, oh, there's no way. You yeah. know, I remember somebody gave me a descendants record, and my I think my dad, this was in like sixth grade, and my dad heard it and he was like, Hey, you, you can't be listening to that. Uh, which there were really only a couple times that happened, and like my parents are really not like that. I think when I was younger, my mom was just really scared that I was going to be some, uh, like a serial killer or something. I don't know. So, (laughs) so (laughs) she was always worried when I would, uh, I don't know when I would do something that seemed not normal, but of course that's not, that's not really real. You know, it's just anyway. So it wasn't an explicit conversation, but it was just kind of something where I was like, and I also wasn't even that interested in music when green day, when that record was out, I was like, well, I don't really care which is hilarious because like, that's, that's everything I am now. But like when I was a kid, I could care less. I was like, I don't like, I think I don't like music, you know, (laughs) you know? Yeah. For a while. Yeah. Yeah. American idiot. That album brought me back to green day after not listening to them for a long time. I liked dookie and I really liked insomniac. And then I just kind of fell off, but American idiot drew me back in. That was a, that's a good one. I still think. Yeah. It's it's crazy. It's like a rock opera, right? Yeah. Cool. So. And I've heard you and Logan speak highly of 
Blink-182 self-titled. And I've spoken about this album with other guests as well. I think it's one of their best. I've listened to it again recently, and there's like maybe five skippers on it, but the good songs are really good, and I think it still stands the test of time. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll paraphrase. This is more of Logan's uh, thought that I'm going to credit here, but the way we talk about that record is that it's so it's so interesting to try to imagine what you could tell, like what kind of band they could have been if Tom would have stayed in the band and like what they were starting to do. Um, even like with weird tracks, like the fallen interlude, and there's so much weird stuff on that record, but they're all still like awesome pop songs. It's a very dark record. It's probably their darkest record. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's kind of a crazy record when you look at even the record before it, toy Paj, which is still pretty like, you know, pop punk friendly or whatever. Right. Uh, Like there's a little bit of Nickelodeon vibes with that record, but I don't know. It's, it's very, um. It's a big jump, I think, to the self-titled, untitled record. And there's so much interesting, weird shit going on. So, you know, uh, it, I think it occupies a cool place for us. Um, but it's also a record I don't think I fully appreciated until <laughs> more recently, honestly. So, yeah, I, you know, I like to see that record becoming an influence and inspirational to younger folks because... I remember when that record came out and it was pretty divisive. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, they're trying to be serious now. Like, uh, I'm not going to listen to this. But I I always liked it. I always liked it from the first time I heard it when it came out in, I think, 2003. Yeah, well, I and I don't actually I think I was still I wasn't listening to that record like when it dropped. You know, it was it was probably four years later when I actually started listening to like that band in general. Yeah. So I don't. You know, I I don't have a good read on like like what you said, what the attitude was at the time, but maybe it's the kind of thing where it's aged a lot more gracefully, you know, than some. Right? I mean, it's certainly considering what they put out after that, after the hiatus, like you know, we had it pretty good. <laughs> now, you and Logan have said that Blink One Eighty Two is also kind of an inspiration for how you operate within Greet Death. You know, you sing songs, Logan will sing songs, right? Right. So how does it work out? Do you just sing the songs you write and he sings the songs he writes? How do you work out the dynamics within the band? Um, A lot of the times that is how it works, but I think that's something we're always open to kind of changing and evolving. For instance, uh, that song, You're Gonna Hate What You've Done, that was originally a song that I wrote and it sounded a lot different. There were only a couple similarities and it sounded more like a Pixies song. It was really weird. And then we kind of left it for a while because we uh, we were like, eh, it's not really, it doesn't really fit with what we do. And then Logan actually brought a version of it back like a year later or something. And he started playing this song for us. And I was like, oh, what is this? This sounds cool. And then he was singing the words and I was like, oh, this is my, this is a song I wrote. He's like re, he like reinterpreted it and rewrote it. And so because of that, it, it was so good that I was like, okay, this is the song now. And Um, he didn't have a second verse. So I was like, okay, like I'll write a second verse. And so sometimes it happens like that where he'll have a song and he's like, I don't know what to do for this part. And I'm like, okay, cool. I got it. Or like, I'll think about it. Um, and so that's kind of a more, um, maybe not more recent, but like we started doing that. We're pretty comfortable with like, oh, if I can't figure this out, why don't you take a shot at it? Or like, this didn't really work so well when I did it, we'll leave it. And then somebody will you know, come back with kind of a reimagined version. Uh, yeah, it really depends. Or sometimes maybe he'll have a song or I'll have a song and we won't even talk about it, but we'll just come together one day and I'll be like, yo, you know that song? Like, I, I actually think I have a cool part that we could put in it. And maybe I'll sing like a bridge or like a, you know, there's a couple new songs we have where that happened too. So it depends. But a lot of the time it is like, okay, I wrote this song. I'm going to sing it. Nice. Yeah. So it sounds like you guys work pretty well together. I mean, the results are great. We've had a lot of time to figure it out. I mean, Logan and I have been writing music and playing music since we were like, you know, 10 years old or 12 years old. So, wow. And how old are you guys now? um, I am 28. We are 28. So you've been playing together a long time. You're locked in. Yep. Yep. So talk about the formation of the band and its evolution. How did it come together? And I know it's gone through some changes over the years, maybe with some lineup changes and certainly in sound as you're evolving uh, walk us through some of that yeah so we had our 
you know, we had our like pop punk band in high school and middle school. We stopped doing that for a second, kind of at the beginning of high school. And then we got really into Logan and I got really into like, um, the big, like indie surf movement that was happening at the time. And in, in like 2010, uh, with like surfer blood and best coast and uh, waves, um, there's probably more, um, we had gone to see a couple of those bands. And I mean, waves is one of Logan's like all time favorite bands. So we were, we started another band with, our buddy, Anthony, who had done some playing with us in the pop punk stuff, but he wasn't really, Anthony was in a band that sounded more like, uh, like no age with, with another guy. So our interests didn't really align until we all kind of got into this kind of punky indie surf type stuff. So we were going to shows in Detroit and we were like, Oh, why don't we do this? So we started a band. It was called pines and we started writing, you know, adjacent things to that stuff. And most of that was just playing in our basement. And we did a couple shows throughout high school at like a local music shop. And that was pretty cool because nothing like that really ever happened in our, in our hometown, but we got a bunch of high school kids to come out um, to some shows. Um, And that was really cool. That was kind of our first experience playing real shows. We would put up like flyers around the, the high school for some of them. It was cool, you know, but um, we took a break from that when Anthony and I went to college, Logan, uh, did go to college, but not till a little, little later, but anyway, you know, there was some, there were some dark years where we were really into like jam music and, and it got really bad and we were playing really <laughs> jammy, like, I don't know, just pretty in, indulgent stuff. I think that served to make us better musicians like with each other, yeah. but it definitely was, it was far from the mark of the better songs we were writing in high school, which is pretty funny. So, um, Anyway, we, we had taken a break, uh, but we got back together at some point because we just missed playing shows and, and uh, being a band. And yeah, we would just do this thing for years where we would write seven songs, play them for a while, scrap them and change our style. We were like a noise band for a while. Um, we had like three songs that were like 15 minutes. We would do that for like a year and a half. But yeah, you know, I, I eventually we played a couple. We, we played a couple shows in Flint, started getting involved in the Flint scene and just kind of realizing, oh, there's a lot more bands out there. Bands would come through, like Cloakroom came through. We, that was one of our first shows in that incarnation of the band as we played with Cloakroom. And we were like, this band is so weird. It's like Weezer, but they're really loud or something, you know? Um, so you just, as you get older and you play music more, you get turned on to different styles. And uh, yeah, I don't know. We've always been very like into singing and doing harmonies. That band Grizzly Bear, we were really into uh, I remember Tame Impala was a big one when we were in like high school and college. So yeah, I don't know. And then later on we got, we we would listen to like Neil Young and King Crimson and stuff in high school. But so all these influences probably make their way into it somehow. Neil Young's a big one. I feel like I'm veering off course a little bit, but it's it's been a lot of changing. And I think it took us a long time to settle on, to kind of figure out what our vibe was. And I, I to an extent, I still think we're figuring, I mean, we are still figuring it out, but yeah. The influences you're naming, I can hear it all. Like I hear, I hate everything and I can hear almost like a country Neil Young type thing. And that caught me off guard, but I really liked what I heard because it almost kind of fits into everything else. Like, even though it's a more acoustic kind of sad song, it just, I don't know. It's just, it's just the vibe fits in with everything else I normally listen to. And then you can listen to other songs and hear like a hum smashing pumpkins thing going right. on, but it all, but it all works together. And Sam, I've heard you and Logan talk about how, you know, there is emphasis on the lyrics and the melodies and the vocals and the song structure and all that. And you can really hear it. And I appreciate that because with your band, I actually pay attention to what you're saying and what you're singing. And, you know, that's something I, I try to do in my own music as well. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's cool to hear about the, the song. uh, I hate everything that, that song is a great example of the, I I guess like the, the exact kind of song that I want to be able to write, which is that it's, it's brooding, it's catchy, it's narrative. And it, I don't know, it doesn't, it's a very like songy song. And for a while I wasn't sure if we could do that as a, as a band, but I'm, it makes me very happy that we've kind of got to the point where we can do a song like that and it works because it is one of my favorite songs that I've written. So yeah, it's just cool to hear that kind of feedback. But um, yeah, I mean, there's always with Logan and I, there's always some, um, I don't know, like a, a lyrical narrative um, focus. 
I think that's something, you know, telling stories through the song that, you know, it doesn't have to be something that's straightforward, but that's how I like to write is, you know, there is a, there is a narrative of some kind. Yeah, absolutely. So the band is together. We're learning our sound. We're developing our sound. I guess you're gigging around Michigan and other places. Yes. Yeah. So talk about moving into the first album and how you ended up signing with Death Wish. Right. Well, Death Wish didn't happen till well after the first record, but we did. So we had some songs in like 2014, 2015, and our friends in Port Huron had like a, a home studio. And that's when we did the seven inch with the, the In Heaven You're Low because they were doing a really cheap rate. And we didn't have a lot of money, but we were like, this is like really cheap. And these are our friends. Let's go do two songs that were pretty new for us. And we did those songs with them. Uh, that was me, Logan, and Anthony. It was, it was very cool, very chill. And we sunk up, we were able to sync up the vinyl, like seven inch release with this uh, festival we played in Michigan called Blood Fest, which was kind of a nice uh, release show for us. But um, the actual release of that was through Flesh and Bone, which also was the first record. And it was our buddy Dylan running that label at the time. He played in a band called Loom from Chicago, which some good friends of ours, they, we started playing around with them and became, they were definitely like role models for us because it was kind of similar style of music and they were, they were touring and we thought that was crazy, you know? And um, so I hit Dylan up and was like, would you be down to do this seven inch? And he was already like a fan of ours. So he was like, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. So we took all the money we had and we did the seven inch and that was our first like big, we had a CD before that of an older song, but that was our first like big physical release. And then when Jake Morse, Dylan stopped doing flesh and bone, cause it was just too much for him. He wanted to just focus on the band, his band. So Jake Morse took over flesh and bone. And when it came time to do Dixieland, we hit him up and he was super down to do it, which is sick. Cause we continue to work with him. But yeah, the, the actual songs on Dixieland, it was just kind of an amalgamation of songs we'd written over the course of like 2014, 2016. And it, we just got to the point where we were like, okay, we did the seven inch, like kind of like a two song EP. I think we have enough songs to do where they all make sense together. Let's just do a record. We had met Nick who had come to see us play at a show in Saginaw, um, which is our friendship with him is funny because he's not, he was in um, that band, the Swellers very different from like, it's pop punk, but it's not, it's not really something we were listening to. So it's like, we knew about him cause he was in the scene recording bands, but we didn't ever see ourselves becoming friends with him or even talking to him. But uh, yeah, he saw us at a show and he was, he was really into it and he, he was really stoked on wanting to record us. So that's who we ended up recording with at his home studio in Saginaw. And yeah, he just became a really good friend. He did New Hell too. Yeah. So, you know, it was pretty, pretty nonchalant. We just went and hung out at his house for both those records for like a, a weekend and, and did the songs. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been digging more into your catalog and I, I just really like what's going on. New Hell, great recording, great songs. You can hear the influences you're, you're talking about. You can hear the thought that goes into the vocal melodies and everything else. So, it, yeah. It's great. Yeah. The, the difference between those two records, when I listen to them, it's so apparent because we did Dixieland all multi-track. We didn't play anything live together. It was like drums first, you know, building it from the ground up, but the new hell stuff, we did it mostly, we did it live. Everything we played live first, and then we just did some overdubs to, you know, make them the full songs that they are. Oh, and interesting. Yeah. That energy shift alone was so so crucial for us, I think, because that's how we do everything now. And I think it just lends to much more of a dynamic energy. You can hear, um, especially with these new recordings, like you can hear that it's just a band playing in a room, which I love, but we didn't do, we could, we weren't ready to do that for the first record. Cause we were so, we were still kind of very new to recording, you know, um, we'd done it a couple of times, a lot in my basement, but not like that. So but the more you play live, we've just been playing more shows together and we were like, okay, I think we're tight enough to just to do it like that. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. Like my, my band is talking about doing some live recordings and I'm like, I don't know if we're ready for that. You know, even now having done plenty of bands, I'm just like, uh, let's wait. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta be really locked in, you know? Yeah. 
And I mean, you know, you also have to be, you have to embrace the quirks that may come from that. Like you might have some interesting noises in the background or you might hit a string weird, but like, that's part of it. That's, that's to me, that's part of the human quality of, of music. And you hear it in, you know, Neil Young's music or Jason Molina's music, or it's certainly worlds away from Blink-182, but I mean, you know, (laughs) that's not, that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I'm, what we're more interested in a recording is hearing that human element. And I want to hear the band in the room. You know, I don't want to hear uh, like a Pro Tools recording. I mean, I'm cool with it. It's just, yeah, when I'm trying to make art, I think I'm much more interested in that, in the room and the band being in the room together. Yeah. And especially for your band, I think it lends itself to those uh, spontaneous moments and sounds and everything, you know? Yeah, totally. I hope so. Yeah, definitely. So at what point do you get the attention of Death Wish? Now, I discovered you when I Hate Everything came out, and I was actually pretty surprised that a band that sounded like this was on Death Wish. And, yeah. But I think that was part of the appeal as well. Yeah, no, we so we put the Dixieland record out, and we were doing some East Coast tours, and I think we actually we did a full U.S. tour with them. Um, there's a band called Mover Shaker from Detroit that we did a lot of shows with, and we kind of um, gigged with in the scene together a lot. And we helped each other tour because we had a band, uh, a van and they were really good at booking, um, which I learned a lot from them too. But so they helped us book a lot of shows. We did a couple tours together and we were getting out on the road, finally doing some longer tours, which was awesome. It was crazy. And at some point I think Dylan who had done the flesh and bone stuff, Dylan Hewlett from loom, like messaged me and was like, yo, death wish put your song on one of their playlists. That's crazy. And I was like, uh, I, I don't think I even really, it didn't mean that much to me at the time. Cause I wasn't, I hadn't really followed death wish before that. I was like a, a fucking indie kid or whatever, you know? So yeah. I was like, Oh, this seems really cool. And he's like, yeah, that's crazy that you guys got on there. Like a lot of people fuck with them or whatever. So I was like, <laughs> cool. And, uh, later, much later, a couple months later, they had, somebody messaged us. I think it ended up being Mark, who was the one that got assigned and who is actually now doing management work for us. But he reached out to us and was like, hey, we are all big fans of your record. Um, just wanted to know what your plans are for the next one. And so at that point, we were like, damn, this is cool. Like a, another label is interested in what we're doing. That's really cool. And it's a cool label. Um, a lot of bands that I don't think we've ever... I don't know how many bands that have been on death wish that we've ever like been fans of personally, but certainly when you see a band like death heaven or, you know, gouge away, you know, that's cool. Right. So, yeah. But, but um, there was a lot of back and forth between Mark and us, um, honestly, for probably like a year and a half. Um, we did demos after we did our first full U S tour. I think it was may of 2018 when we demoed new hell sent it over they were like, this is cool. We probably don't have time to put it out this year though. And we were like, yeah, that's fine. And it kind of fizzled off and we didn't really think we were going to work with them at all. But they did, uh, like a year later, they got back to us and asked about the record again. And at that point we had the record um, fully recorded because we did that in the fall of 2018. So yeah, basically they, you know, they liked it. I think we ended up cutting a couple tracks to make it fit on a single LP, uh, which I think was a good move because it made the LP a lot more concentrated. And um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much how that went down. It came out at the end of 2019, right before COVID. And yeah, I think that's it. It's been really great working with them. Mark doesn't even work with them anymore. He actually moved on and just does management for us, which is crazy because he's the one that got assigned and he, you know, he's just a very good friend now and just loves working with us. So that's the, that's the kind of people we try to surround ourselves with, you know, people who are passionate and believe in what we're doing and who we also believe in them and just want to have them around, you know? Absolutely. So what was it like? I mean, the record comes out right before COVID. COVID hits. I mean, you're sidelined along with every other band. Was it discouraging? I mean, how, how did you fare during all this? Yeah, it was really weird because we weren't even able to do a full tour on the record. Um, Jim actually had some personal stuff come up and he couldn't even, we had a tour planned, like it's a couple weeks, like three weeks, uh, East and down South. And Logan and I ended up doing that, that tour alone, just solo, um, not solo, but you know, just acoustic 
because Jim couldn't come. So the first tour we did promoting new hell, we had all the records and stuff was, was me and Logan playing the songs without drums. <laughs> uh, and we still had that. We, I mean, it was electric. We had our, um, our half stacks, but like, you know, it was not a great death. It's not a true great death show. We had a lot of fun doing that, but it was very, it was weird. Right. And then we got back from that. We did a week long tour in February, 2020. And then right then, uh, COVID hit, we were going to do a full U S with deaf heaven and inter arma. And just like, like you said, like everybody else that got canned. Um, so yeah, obviously we were bummed. I remember getting that call from, uh, deaf heavens management and they were like, yeah, we got to scrap it. And, uh, like it was a bummer, but it also was a little expected, you know? So we were kind of just like, well, okay, we're moving forward, you know? And for us, that just meant we started, we tried, it took a minute, but we established monthly meetups in Michigan. I would take a train to Michigan. We, we kept writing. That's how the new, uh, the new songs came about. So we haven't really stopped doing stuff. It's just, we couldn't tour for a while. It's been pretty formative for us because we've had a lot of time. Jackie joined the band to play bass. I moved to guitar. So we've had time to get acquainted with our new dynamic and play live a lot together in a controlled setting we also do all our recording with Jackie now at her home studio. So we've really had an entire dynamic shift over the, over the course of uh, COVID and, and quarantine that has been extremely productive for us. So you roll with the punches, you know? That's good to hear. Yeah, because I've talked to a lot of bands and some didn't do anything over COVID and that's just the way it went. But it sounds like you got used to the new lineup and you, you just strengthened yourselves during the whole process. Yeah. I mean, we weren't just going to sit around and do nothing. So yeah, I mean, you got to use your time to do something. And for us, that's what we did. And it's been good. I think we were, I, it, the way we talk about it is like, it, it almost, it's fitting that that Def Heaven tour didn't end up happening because we were a three piece at the time. And I don't, I don't know if we would have been even ready to put on the best of shows for that tour. And if it would have happened, that would have been cool. But now that it's played out the way it did, I think I'm really I think we're all really happy that it played out the way it did because it led to us almost coming out with an entirely new uh, band, you know, a new dynamic and we're that much better for it. So we just did uh, a big lap around the U S with our friends in infant Island. That was our first big tour. Um, And we did some dates with the world is last year. And by our first big tour, I mean, our first big tour after COVID, but both of those tours were great. And we're about to do, we're about to leave in a week to do the foxing tour. So it's not, uh, it's not slowing down, which is cool. Had you done a lot of touring before the whole death wish thing, like the full U S tours and all of that type of thing? A decent amount. I think that's, you know, that's part of the reason why we got signed because you gotta, you know, if you show that you're, you're trying to grind, you know, um, that just, it looks that much better. Um, because, they know you're going to get out there and do work, but yeah, we'd done a couple full U S tours, a bunch of East coast tours, a bunch of Midwest runs. So we're pretty familiar with going around the country in a van. Yeah. So I guess, but I mean, before you have the intervention of the label and booking agents and all that stuff, I guess you're just doing it yourself with your connections, right? Yep. I mean, that was both me and uh, the band. We did some touring with mover shaker. We just, you go, you go somewhere, you meet people, or you reach out to people online. I mean, the first couple of tours I booked, I was making phone calls from my basement in like 2015. And we were like, okay, maybe we can play a show in, uh, in like Indiana on the way down to Asheville. Our first tour was literally Evansville, Indiana and Asheville, North Carolina and home. That was it. <laughs> it was a 10 hour drive home. But to us, that was crazy. We were like, we just played two shows out of state and they both were pretty good. Uh, so yeah, we got, we got lucky, but and then you do Chicago and you're like, it's, you do it a little at a time and then you get your spreadsheet and you're like, okay, let me try to turn everything green. Let me reach out. Let me send some emails or a lot of Facebook messages. And the more you do it, the more people you meet, the more people you can reach out to next time, you know, it's touch and go. But, um, that was how we were doing it. I mean, I booked multiple full us tours, 40 shows just that way, like Facebook messenger and, uh, email. <laughs> so. I love that. Yeah. So do you, you have a booking agent and everything now through the, the label, right? Do they help do, do they just get everything booked for you? So actually not. We, the label doesn't have, most labels aren't going to, I mean, I can't speak for most labels, but a lot of labels don't, they're not going to have a, an in-house booking agent. We actually got, we were on Death Wish for 
probably a couple of years before we got our booking agent, which is uh, Jake from heavy talent just mm-hmm. reached out to us and was like, you know, said he was a fan. We looked at the bands he booked and it's all so many bands that are just workhorse bands that we respect, even though like they're definitely, he books a lot of metal bands, which is funny because we're also on death wish, but so, <laughs> but um, it was a little bit of a different thing for, for him too. Cause I think they're trying to branch out and book different kinds of bands. But yeah, I mean, even on Death Wish, I guess a lot of our Death Wish time has been in COVID times, so there wasn't really much booking happening. Right. But um, I mean, the Deaf Heaven thing, that was just them reaching out and asking us to tour. Um, I had booked a couple of DIY runs. Then COVID hit. We took a couple of years off. And during COVID, our booking agent reached out to us and we decided to work with him because we had a couple of phone calls and he's he's a very cool dude, very chill. And the tours he's booked so far have been have been good. So... That's yeah. great. Yeah. And uh, how has the reaction been? I mean, because it sounds like you weren't completely familiar with the bands on Death Wish and, and that whole world. Like, how is it like coming into this? I mean, for the most part, completely positive. I think it's really interesting being like a band that doesn't sound like a lot of the other bands on a label just because you stand out because of that. You know, I'm not somebody that goes and reads YouTube comments. I very purposely stay away from that but i'm sure there's you know i've seen my share of some people are like you know what the fuck is this but for the most part (laughs) that is not what we experience uh we it's we we get mostly positivity from the people who you know the people who enjoy what we do it's also okay if people don't enjoy what we do it doesn't have to be for everybody so yeah no it's been great especially with the new songs because they're obviously there's a lot of acoustic stuff on the new songs and piano So I think Logan has said that he's seen more stuff of people, you know, questioning why we're doing that, which, you know, that doesn't matter to me. Like, we're going to make the kind of music we want to make. We're also not going to stop making like rock music. So it's not some kind of indication that we're going to be an acoustic band. But I think it's just we we want to make more than one kind of music. And I think it's just we're starting to be able to write the kind of music we want to write holistically rather than okay, here's a shoegaze song. You know what I'm saying? Like that doesn't really interest us anymore. Right. Um, And it probably never did. It's just, we were like, damn, this is really cool to take fuzzy, heavy guitars and write like singer songwriter music. Uh, So I think we're kind of moving that that's the, the umbrella of what we work under. Yeah. It's like it's their songs, but sometimes it's really heavy. Sometimes it's not. No, that I think that's one of the biggest appeals of the band greet death is the versatility you can do an acoustic sad kind of sounding song like i hate everything and then you can do like these big triumphant rock songs like you hear on new hell like you you can do it all try to not 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 try to do it all but we you know we we also listen to a lot of different kinds of music so we're i think our influences are always kind of fluctuating you know yeah but even band like um Adrian Lanker, you know, very much fans of their work and um, a lot of, you know, a lot of singer songwriters, Towns Van Zandt, Neil Young, Jason Molina. Um, So I think naturally that's going to make its way in there in addition to heavier bands like Hum and Smashing Pumpkins or whatever, you know. Right. So have you seen a much bigger reaction since the four new singles have come out? I mean, that's when I discovered you. Shows are happening again. Things are opening back up. Yeah. I mean, it's been, um, yeah, the reaction to just the four singles has honestly been crazy, especially cause you know, I didn't, they're, they're, the songs are different than the new hell stuff and that they're, they're a lot more like Elliot Smithy kind of softer dynamically. So to me, it's cool to see such big growth from just the four songs. There was already huge growth for us from new hell alone. And what's funny about that is we couldn't even play shows for most of that cycle and which is still i would say it's still going we haven't toured out on that record but yeah it's been really cool i especially because of how much a song like i hate everything or uh, uh punishment existence means to me i love that people are feeling those songs and feeling impacted by them because that's that's how we feel as well um so it feels good you know it's i'm glad people are digging it and um yeah i'm excited for what we're gonna do next so am i you know i heard I hate everything first. And like I mentioned to you earlier, you know, I, I had not connected with a song like that in a really long time. And I'm not, 
necessarily just talking about the lyrical content. Now, I'm talking about the whole package. You know, this is one of those times where I sent this to everybody and I'm like, you've got to hear this. And just reading about the band and reading about you, Sam, it seems like there's an element of sadness to it, you know? And if I'm connecting to it, there's got to be an element of sadness to it because <laughs> that, that's part of me. You know, I like really dreary post-rock and ambient stuff and and a lot of that kind of stuff and just stuff heavy with emotion, whether it's happy or sad. So wh- what goes into the music, Sam? What have what have you dealt with in your life? What do you deal with in your life? Um, I think more than ever, what you're hearing in the music is what's happening in in my life and our lives, especially a song like that is actually pretty literal. Um, it's not always going to be that way. I think it can be exhausting to write like that sometimes, but I think more than ever, Logan and I are channeling a lot of our just experiences and feelings into the songs in a way that maybe the first record, the first two records um, weren't quite as literal, maybe more metaphor happening. But New Hell was also kind of a jump to more literal songwriting. The Dixieland stuff is very, there's a lot more like imagery and symbolism. Uh, and I'm not trying to like uh, overly complicate it. I think the vagueness of that record is something that shows our youth, I think. But um, yeah, I mean, a song like I Hate Everything, that's just that there's a lot of personal feelings of just doing the same thing day in, day out having trouble connecting to people, um, being angry, um, being bored. Um, just like in a song like Do You Feel Nothing, which is very, in a way it's similar, but it's a lot angrier of just like feeling so stuck and uh, like you can't get anywhere. Nothing is making you happy. Even the thing you like to do is not making you happy. So there is a lot of, I think a lot of the, a lot of the things that, we struggle to deal with on a daily basis, make their way into our music because it's kind of, it goes in with those great questions of like, how do you cope with this? How do you do this every day? You know? And it's not, I'm not, it's not supposed to sound wholly depressing because I think the answer is you, you find meaning how you can and you come together with people and share those experiences and you, you find unity through those emotions, which, which for me and for us, I think is one of the primary things we're trying to do with, with art is just to find identity. And when I, when a song means something to me, it makes me feel less it's it's because it makes me feel less alone. And so that's kind of the energy that I channel that we channel into what we, what we write in a way. That's great. No, it makes absolute sense because this is one of those moments where I heard the music and I'm like, it's almost like this is written specifically for me (laughs) or like, I wish that I wrote this and that's the best feeling in the world. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I'm that's means a lot that you connected with the song that way. I don't know, especially with that song. It's such a shift in tone for us, but I think it works so well. And it's it's become one of my favorite songs to play live right now, which I didn't even know if it was going to, you know, sometimes you do recording a lot of times and you're like, I don't know if this is we can do this and make it sound as good. But the live version we have sounds even better, I think. Oh. Um and it's also a song where like it's perfectly in my vocal zone. And I think I've learned that I want to write more songs in that in that register because I'm able to do a lot with my uh, voice in that zone that I that I like personally. So, yeah, a lot of learning through it. But I'm glad that people connect with that song because it's just uh, it, it feels good. It's one of my favorites. Oh, yeah, it's great. And I love everything you've done so far. We've got four singles out right now. Panic song. Punishment Existence, Your Love is Alcohol, and I Hate Everything. And where where is it all leading? Is there going to be an album? Is there going to be an EP? I saw on Twitter today that there's a Greet Death announcement tomorrow. Or can you reveal what is coming? Um, I can't be specific, but I mean, it that does directly relate to these songs. And mm. it's going to be happening tomorrow or midnight tonight. If you, I mean, when this podcast comes out, this will already have happened. But for yes. you... For you and anybody you want to tell, uh, Midnight Tonight, that will pretty much be a thing. Well, I'm looking forward to that because, I mean, I'm kicking myself. I'm like, where the hell was I in 2019? (laughs) How didn't I hear these guys? What's going on? But uh, you know what? We're here now, and that's all that matters. Well, even for us, like, you know, someone like you or anybody that finds these new songs and is like, damn, this is cool. This band is sick. 
I think you, it just shows that you can't like, you really have to grind a lot and you have to play shows and you have to go a lot of places and you have to put in a lot of work and little by little people will either like your music or they won't, but people will get turned on to you or tell other people about you. It's always been kind of a slow climb for us and it, in a way that feels very good and organic. So even signing with death wish or getting our booking agent, nothing was like promised to us. That was like grandiose. It was like, you know, you guys work hard. We want to work hard with you. That's how it's going to be. So there wasn't this promise of like, we're going to do this for you. or We're going to get you this. It's going to be crazy. And I think that's another reason why we ended up working with the people we work with is because you can sense that like-minded desire to grind and work for each other, you know, and just kind of see what happens. Yeah, no, you're spot on with that. I think things need to happen organically, like you're describing. If you set out with a goal in mind, like, hey, I'm going to start a band and get signed with X label and right. have uh, X amount of audience, you're, you're almost setting yourself up to fail because there's no guarantees. Sam, you and Logan have been playing together since you're 10 years old. This is what you do. This is what you'll be doing. So it just, you know, you build and you build and you get better and, and these things grow. And here we are. I mean, Three years ago, a podcast wasn't even a thought in my mind, but this just became something that I do. And now it's the primary thing that I do. And here we are talking to each other right now about what each of us do. Yeah, I, totally. And I think the important, the most important thing to do if you are a creator or if you want to create anything is you have to keep your enjoyment of what you're making at the forefront. And then, you know, regardless of what level of uh, success you achieve. I think that's relative anyway. Um, if you, if you enjoy what you're making, somebody else is going to enjoy it. It, the, the, the time frame that that happens is up for it's in the air, but if you're enjoying what you're creating and you're kind of learning as you go, that's, you have to find fulfillment in that too. And then, you know, whatever else you want to do with that. So it's, you know, it, it can be discouraging because there's a lot of invisible labor. It's mostly invisible labor that goes into anything creative, like probably starting a podcast and like not a lot of people are listening. It's like, oh, well, I wish more people were listening, but like, that's just how it is. You, you have to, you have to start from the ground, right? Exactly. Exactly. And for me in particular, and uh, I used to do the show with my friend, but uh, he has since uh, moved on to greener pastures. Okay. Um, we're lucky in the fact that, I don't know, in the very beginning, at least like 40 people would be listening. And that was huge to me because yeah. I, I thought it was literally going to be like three. And the way I always equated it was, okay, if, ex if as many people listen to each episode would show up to a show, if I played a live show, I'm very happy. I'm right. very happy. And I've always been happy with the number, always. Yep. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, the the same thing. That's our attitude whenever we whenever we play a show. You know, I mean, this last tour, this last tour we did went so well, and I can't believe how many people we played to in most of the rooms we played to. But the truth is that, especially when you go somewhere new, like however many people you play for, you play to them, and then next time you come back, maybe you play to their friends, maybe you play to eight people instead of four. That's how it's always been, and that's how it that's how it is for a lot of. Um, I recently started getting into like doing Twitch streaming and YouTube videos and content. And it's the same thing. It's like, you know, you're going to be doing this thing for not a lot of people for a while, but if you enjoy it and you're putting your, if you're passionate about what you're making and trying to make the best thing you can make and learn through the process, then that's kind of all you can be doing. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, this is, uh, this is, I've managed like seven social media accounts yeah. for this podcast, but I love doing it. This is like, this is what I enjoy doing the most. Now, you mentioned your Twitch streaming. Now, we have to talk about this because I spend every spare minute of my time on Twitch. Oh, okay. Sad sadly, not broadcasting because uh, I want to do it more, but I just can't commit to a schedule. But what are you doing on Twitch? So the Twitch thing for me and videos is something that like, you know, I, I'm, I'm big into video games and I always have been. So has Logan. But like just with uh, quarantine and not being able to, do the stuff we normally do. I kind of took that opportunity and said, this is something I've always wanted to try to do. So why don't I get a setup? It, it's kind of daunting because you have to get, you know, you need a computer, you need a camera, you need a mic, you need to know how to use the software. It's been a big process, but I 
I started just doing it and my partner kind of encouraged me to just do it. Uh, it's, it's hard because, you know, it's kind of like new territory and a lot of it's very, um, daunting to me, but yeah, I've just spent a lot of quarantine learning how to use certain software and doing streams and learning from my mistakes and doing videos. I was just doing, uh, videos on like a MacBook pro from 2011 and like <laughs> a tiny interface and a, and a, and a microphone. Um, and it was pretty much like destroyed my laptop, but, uh, eventually I'd saved up some money and got a, you know, I got all the equipment and I, now I'm to the point where, um, I had like a channel that was going and it was very, it reminded me of being a band, like starting out, like and playing shows. And it's like, all right, I'm streaming to like two people right now. Yeah. That's, o- that's okay. Because the other thing I do is I record it all. And so most of the streams I do, I, I'm going to edit and upload as videos. So even if nobody's watching, it's a video. So I'm approaching it like it's, it's content, you know, it's, I'm not just streaming to nobody and not talking anyway, I'm going to go on a tangent if I, if I talk too long about that, but it's been a big process for me. And I actually just did a rebranding and did some new channel art and, and renamed the, the channel. And what happened was because I had put in some work, you know, the past couple of years on it, there was more engagement with that announcement right off the bat. And I saw people getting excited And that was cool. That's like, that's, that's growth to me. And that shows that the work I've been doing did something and I'm, it's cool. You know, what do you stream? Um, like games wise or yes, it depends. I like to, I I feel like I haven't found my, just like with the music thing, you have to, you got to find your voice as a creator, like whatever you're doing. I'm sure you went through that with, with the podcast, right? Like what kind of podcaster are you? What do you, what's your voice? What's your tone? Who do you want to interview? Um, so there's so many different kinds of videos you can do. You can do like narrative videos. I think I've decided that I like to do more live format just with a camera, with a microphone, minimal scripting, kind of very reactionary playing through games. I just did a a playthrough of a horror game, uh, called no one lives under the lighthouse. It's a very indie old school graphics, uh, just horror game that some people in Ukraine developed, but it was cool. And it was, it was fun to play and kind of react to. Um, I like playing challenging games that are very tough and you have to kind of work at them a lot to overcome because those are kind of the things I like to watch. So yeah, I I think I'm still figuring it out, but I'm chipping away at it. You know, it's something I've wanted to do for so long and I I made a little money last year doing it. So I think if I do it for like 10 more years, maybe I'll be able to make a little more money. I don't know. That's fantastic. Yeah. During pandemic, I didn't, I barely went on YouTube. I didn't even know what Twitch was. I wasn't playing nearly as many video games as I am now. And then pandemic hit and I discovered Call of Duty multiplayer. Okay. And I became obsessed. I haven't been that into gaming since I discovered Doom in 1995 or whatever it was. So yeah. I got really into Call of Duty multiplayer. I discovered YouTube. I discovered content creators. And then last year I signed up for Twitch, just, you know, I just watching channels. And then late last year, I guess in November, I finally started streaming and you know, it is a lot of work. I had to figure, I got the gaming PC. I've got this whole setup. I stayed up at night thinking about it, dreaming about it. And then I finally did it. And like you, Sam, I don't stream that much. I wish I could more, but it's like, I just can't commit to a schedule. I I can feel myself like pushing and I need to go in that direction, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. I started out streaming the Nintendo 8-bit classics. Oh, cool. And then I just did all Warzone. But I think I want to do like a mix. You know, I, I don't want to be just a Warzone streamer because I watch a lot of Warzone streamers and I, I don't like most of them. So I don't gotcha. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even just doing the, the technology aspect is really daunting for me because I, you know, I use tech, uh, computers and gaming systems a lot, but I'm not, I'm not very versed. So a lot of the stuff I do is very like on the fly learning okay, let me take an hour to learn Photoshop so I can start making better thumbnails. I did that the other night and that felt really good. I have a, I have Photoshop, but I've never learned it. And I've always used a really shitty program to just make my thumbnails. Yeah. And I, the other night I was just like, okay, I did this whole like rebrand and like, let me just take some time to try to do this better. So I watched some videos. I learned how to make a thumbnail and I made one that 
I was very proud of, and I thought it was the best thing I've done thumbnail wise. So that felt good. And little milestones like that feel good. But anyway, what I was going to say is I bet learn the podcast thing alone is like daunting when you've probably never done it. It's like, okay, I need an interface. I need a mic. I need a program. I need, I don't know. I need a PC or whatever. Like it's the same thing. I went into podcasting very naive and I'm (laughs) glad I did because if I had known how many great podcasts are out there or all the work that went into it, I may have been discouraged. Yeah. But I really just wandered into it like a like a little kid or something. And I was like, oh, let's just do it. And I think that's the best way to do it. I did the same thing with Twitch. Like my first, I don't know, five broadcasts, the audio was all messed up and you couldn't hear me or you couldn't yeah, hear the game. Yeah. And I still don't know if my notifications work. I still don't know. But at, at this point, I think I've got the audio thing down. I can get on there. You can hear me. You can hear the game. So it's a it's a work in progress. Yeah, I mean, it's the biggest issue I face, and I imagine so many people face this issue, is I just look at people who their content is so good, their channels are so good, they're so set up, and I just think I'll never, if I can't make content this good right away, why should I try? And that's exactly. it's terrible. And that's something I've also tried to fix about myself during quarantine is to just be okay with being bad at something, be okay with being a total novice and just to start. Cause that's the only way you can learn. It goes for anything playing music or whatever. And so just like you said, you start your recording and your game volumes too loud or whatever your audio sounds terrible. Cool. Next time it'll be a little better. Like yeah. I, you can't, it's so hard for me to, it's been hard to, to change that about myself, but it's led to such good improvements in my, in my mindset about doing things. And I I wish that we were taught more about how to learn and how to go about learning to improve at things in in school, because that's something that I just is not really taught. And absolutely. And you know what? There's no shortcuts. You just like you're saying, Sam, you have to go through the process and learn and you just have to keep doing it until you get better. And it's a process because even if you're some bullshit artist who has a billion dollars and you just buy your way into whatever it is you're trying to do, people see that and they yeah. don't respect you. You you have to go through the process. Yeah. But it's it's hard because you have to be patient and you have to, you just have to be okay with being bad. And I say bad as in like just novice, inexperienced, not as good as the people you look up to. You want to be as good as the bands you look up to or as good as the streamers or the, the visual artists you look up to, but they didn't start out good. You know how many songs or paintings or streams they've done that nobody has seen or that that were terrible or that they thought were terrible anyway i'm on a diatribe now but it's so important because once you once you learn to enjoy the process of learning and becoming better and just i don't know there was so much satisfaction in just learning how to make a simple decent looking thumbnail in photoshop for me that was like the biggest win i've had in a minute and it felt good and now i know how to do it so no, I, I love this. I'm literally on Twitch every spare minute of my day watching streamers. Like, that's what I do. Is it mostly Call of Duty or do you watch other stuff? I watch a couple Call of Duty streamers. I, I watch a couple game variety streamers. I watch a couple NES streamers. It's, right. it's, it's like it's all gaming, just different flavors of gaming. Yeah, cool. We'll, we'll have to swap uh, tags after you can send it to me or something. That'd be cool to check out. Absolutely. And you're, you're inspiring me now, Sam. I'm like, I have to get on a schedule. I have to get on a schedule and stream because I, uh, but the thing is like, I'm so introverted. So when I'm, when I finally get off the podcast or get done editing or whatever else, it's like, I don't want to jump on camera and then perform for I know. Twitch. You know? I know. Well, and here's the thing. I don't, I was, I was really stressed out about like having a schedule for a while. Like, okay, I need a schedule or I'm not going to be successful. Right. I don't, Obviously, I don't really have any amount of success, but one one of the ways that I kind of get around not having a, a schedule right now, um, because I'm about to leave for tour and it's just I can't I can't fully delve into like setting that up right now. Right. Is I do I do the YouTube stuff so that if people don't see my stream, I it's in a video. You know, if I'm doing a let's play or something and I wanna it, you know, I want people to see it, but not just on the stream, then it's a way to know that your stream wasn't really wasted because then it becomes content that's there, you know, forever. And obviously you need vid- video editing software for that. That's a whole different thing. But um, that's kind of one of the ways I've gotten around it. And I've only done like one stream, one or two streams since getting back from this other tour. But um, I don't, 
I think there's ways to do it without having a set in stone schedule, at least for a while, you know, and then maybe eventually if you want to, you can be like, okay, every Tuesday, every Thursday, whatever. Um, I think right now I'm just going to do some late night streams and do some games I like, and uh, I might try to do one or two more before I leave. And, but yeah, the YouTube thing has helped me because even if nobody's watching, I'm proceeding as if I'm creating content, you know, that's going to be there forever because I am. I like that. That's how I found Twitch in the first place. I found streamers that I like their YouTube content. And I was like, wait, let me go direct to the source. Yeah. So, but well, I'm not an, I'm not an expert. I just, I'm the schedule thing has stressed me out too. And I'm trying to find ways to at least temporarily not have to worry about it. Cause if I worry about that, I won't do it. I'll be like, Oh, I'm not going to bother streaming. Cause I don't have a schedule. You've you know? inspired me. You have reignited the flame, Sam. And I've been thinking about <laughs> it for a while. Folks, new scene gaming is coming. Well, good. You heard it here first. Do you want to give your Twitch handle so people can follow you? Yeah. Is yours new scene gaming? Is that what you just said? Or mine is just the new scene. The new scene. Okay. I'll write that down. Um, yeah. Mine, <laughs> I did. I just changed it. So it's a little more linked with the band uh, brand, which is it's Death Boy Games. Nice. Death Boy Games. And it's the boy is the B-O-I because of our whatever shitty handle. Um <laughs> But and I had my buddy Liam and my partner Larissa re, uh, redo all the artwork. So yeah, it's it's on YouTube, it's on Twitch. I've only done one video so far, but you know I got plans. <laughs> well, I From I'm what? inspired. I'm inspired. I've got to do it too. So folks, follow Death Boy Games, and while you're at it, follow the new scene. You can watch me stream Warzone and get my butt kicked. I'm into it. <laughs> well, that's let's... cool though. That's cool that you stream too. Yeah, I, I hey, whenever uh, I'm talking to a guest and they stream or they're into Twitch, I, I seize upon it like a hungry dog because I love it. It's it's my pastime. Cool. What kind of games do you play? Um, I always like to I forgot to mention that one of the one of the main things I watch on Twitch is I like fighting games a lot and I'm not I'm not very good at them, but it's one of my goals to slowly I like to just learn about them and become better. I don't, I've gone to a couple local like tournaments, but I don't really, I haven't done a lot of meetups, but um, I, I don't know. Fighting games are so fascinating and because they're the level of um, kind of knowledge you have to have about the game to actually play it at a high level is, is crazy. And it's really not that different from a game like Call of Duty. Cause if you want to play Call of Duty at a high level, you, I mean, you can't, you can't just jump in and, and pull the trigger. You have to learn a lot. You have to learn the maps. You have to learn um, how all the guns work. You have to learn movement. It's, it's the same, but the way that it happens in fighting games is very fascinating to me. So I watch a lot of fighting game content. I watch a lot of people talk about how to improve and even just watching fighting game content has taught me things about how to just improve your mindset about learning in general, mainly just like, the hardest thing about fighting games is being bad. You're going to jump in and be bad. Yeah. You know, how can you not? You don't know the characters. You don't know the moves. You have to learn your moves. So I think a lot of people are discouraged by that, and including me. But once you accept, just like other things, once you accept that when you start, you're going to be bad, you don't have to know everything at once and you don't have to learn how to do everything at once. Just take it one thing at a time. Learn one thing. Learn one thing and practice it. Learn the next thing. And then slowly over time, your brain will memorize how to do those things and you won't have to think about them and you can concentrate on other things. And I think that concept alone applies to almost any other concept of learning. Uh, so that's why fighting games interest me a lot. But what um, fighting game are you playing now? What's your focus? Well, I was I was playing a lot of that Guilty Gear Strive. It's an anime fighting game. Uh, just because I like the artwork a lot. I like artwork in games. If it's If it appeals to me, I'm probably going to play it. Logan and I have always been into Mortal Kombat. I don't really play that at a high level. I mean, I don't play anything at a high level, but Mortal Kombat's kind of a staple. Other than that, I, I always like to have like an MMO that I can absentmindedly grind on. Uh, I've been playing a lot of Black Desert online. Uh, recently, I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft the first year of quarantine. Yeah, so I, I jumped back into EverQuest. I haven't played nice. recently, but I like it. I like it. Yeah, I just like to have... A game like that that I can get on late night and do some grinding and like watch a show while I do it or something, you know, it that's fun to me. It's very relaxing. Games have always been a place of relaxation and kind of detox from a stressful day. So exactly. Sam, we sound very similar. It's probably why <laughs> I connect with you and your music so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, maybe, but that's really cool to to hear your um that that's something you're into as well. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the advice you have uh, in regards to fighting games and everything is great advice. And I think for anything, you just have to go into it and have a goal in mind. Like I play Warzone and I'm like, oh, man, I'm not dropping 20 in a game and winning every time. Like these professionals that I watch, I suck and I get so discouraged. And it's like, no, just like there's a streamer. I watch a Warzone streamer called Iron. He's he's my favorite Warzone streamer. And he's like, just he's like, have a what did he say? Something like have a goal in mind have one yep. goal in mind of something you want to accomplish and i was like and later on i was thinking about it i was like yeah like you're, you're not going to jump in and be the best the game is crazy the amount of stuff you have to learn is insane yeah so i just have to think of one goal and accomplish that and start there 100 percent. just like in, in a in a fighting game maybe your goal is to land an anti-air somebody yeah. jumps at you and you're able to hit them out of the air that's your goal and then you try to get more consistent at that figure right. out what move is good to use for that and do it. And then eventually you won't have to think about that. And that applies to, I mean, I took time over quarantine to try to play a lot more guitar. Uh, I was playing a lot of metal, which I've never done before, but I got a little Roland cube and I got a little uh, Jackson uh, dinky. And I, I, I've always felt pretty limited on the guitar, but over quarantine, I've gotten a lot better because I've played a lot more guitar and I've taken time to just repetitively do things and it can be discouraging to try to play something and just realize, oh, I'm not, I can't technically do this right now, but that shouldn't be your, your goal. Your goal should be to maybe slow it down. You can't do something full speed, play it really slow and do that repeatedly, watch TV and do it, do something. And then eventually your hand will know, you'll just be able to do it and you can do it a little faster. So progress isn't really always something you're not going to consciously be aware of it the whole step of the way, you know, if you do something enough, you will get better at it, but you won't. The frustrating thing is that you're like, damn, I'm not really good at this now. Right. And that's just not how life works. But my brain, and I think a lot of people's brains, we don't, we're not patient. We want to get there. We want to be good now. And it's so hard to accept that that's just not how it works. But once you do, and you start to set these goals for yourself, like, okay, let me learn this riff. Let me learn this riff. Let me start it slow first. My hand can't pick it as fast as it is, you know, normally. Let me slow it down. I was doing that with a Cannibal Corpse song. Uh, it was like Hammer Smash Face, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the classic. That song's fast. It's kind of hard to play full speed. So I, I've played that song slowed down so much, and I started to be able to play it a little faster. And that's kind of, that's what it is, you know? Wow. Yeah. No, th- th- you just have to stick to the things you love. Look. I love playing music. I love gaming. Uh, I'm always going to do them. Uh, so you just stick to the things you love and you you keep doing them and then uh, you get better at them over time. Yeah, like little milestones, like making a better thumbnail. That's a victory and you should feel good about stuff like that or landing your anti-air or whatever, Learning, knowing where to pick something up. And I, sorry, I don't play Warzone, so the analogy doesn't work here, but you know, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Uh, you yeah. Need to well, do. folks, last night, I, uh, since we're on the subject, I played the new map and I clinched a one V three at, in the end game and ended the match with a win and 11 kills. So if yeah, you play sick. Warzone, you know what all that means and you know, it's awesome. Yeah, that's sick. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, and what, and the point is if it brings you joy, then that is very meaningful because Joy is something you should hold on to and try to find however you can in this life. (laughs) I don't know what it says about me, but nothing makes me happier than succeeding and winning in Warzone. Nothing. Like I I could have a podcast episode, do magnificent numbers, and the Warzone win, I think, would still make me happier. It's a cool thing. That's all I have to (laughs) say. I relate to that. As someone who's played a lot of Halo in high school and to this day, I relate to that. (laughs) <laughs> I think it's the competitive nature and the winning. It's like, you know, out of 150 people, I won. Me. Yeah. Well, let's recap, folks. Now, if you somehow have not heard Greet Death, you need to. You need to go out right now and listen to everything they have. Sam, I will say one of my absolute favorite bands doing it right now. I know you've been around for oh. a while now, but I think it's very exciting what's happening and I love what's going on, and I can't wait to hear more. What do you think of that? No, well, thank you very much. I still feel like we're babies as far as our band is concerned, but we're we're working on it. So I appreciate you and anybody else who who uh, listens and and finds meaning in what we're doing. Yes. So, folks, check out Greet Death. We've got singles out there. We've got albums out there, and there's some announcement happening tonight. 
uh, or something is happening tonight at midnight. We don't know exactly what it is, but we're very excited about it, right? That's correct. There you go. And you can catch Greet Death on tour with Foxing and Home is Where. That kicks off July 5th in Nashville, Tennessee. Yes? That's correct. Looking forward to it. So you have, I mean, you have to go see them. You just have to. So there you go. I'm excited to get back out and, and play some songs. We're trying to, now that we've done a couple tours the past year on a lot of stuff we've been playing for a while, we're trying to incorporate some some new stuff into the into the sets. So we're trying to bring a different set so you guys don't have to see the, uh, you know, the same stuff you've been seeing again. Excellent. Well, Sam, I just want to say thank you so much. You know, I love the band. I love that you're on Twitch. Uh, I'm going to follow you after this. And I'm looking forward to more from the band and seeing you at some point. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And there you have it, Sam Boyteri. Excellent conversation from an excellent band. You know, hearing about their history. Josh, Sam and Logan have been playing together since they're 12 years old, and they are now 28. It's wild to think that they've been doing it for so long, and they're just like finding their rhythm and hitting their stride. It almost reminds me of like stand-up comics. They have to grind for so long. You know, it's like you think it, it sometimes it takes like 20 years for somebody to like find their voice and like get into it, like the commitment level to like stick with it for 16 years. And like it's just it's 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 I'm thrilled that they did. Yeah, same here. As I was editing this conversation, I was thinking about it and I was like, wow, think about how many bands out there are doing their thing, grinding, writing establishing themselves and we don't know about them yet and one day they're going to pop up and have an effect on us like greet death has it's a wonderful thing Mm -hmm. it really is and it's like yeah it's it's an incredible dedication to the craft i mean that is a that's a long history already and and they're just a couple albums in yeah already they've made a great impact on us and others i can't wait to hear more you know, Josh and I were talking about this before we hit record, but I haven't had a reaction to a band like this in a while. I'm sending this to everybody. And I, I, I you, Josh, Josh, you're pretty much the only person I trade music with because you and I are on pretty much the same wavelength and everything you've sent me, I dug. And I think everything I've sent you, you dug, and we actually like continue to listen to it. Yep. So, you know, I, I sent these records to everybody and I'm like, Look, you have to listen to this. You just have to. I haven't had a reaction like this in a long time. It just hits all those right notes. Alternative, the heavy kind of hum type guitars, Smashing Pumpkins, all that stuff. And then the broody acoustic stuff that's going on on the new EP, but it also has like its heavier moments. And I don't mean heavy, like hardcore heavy. I mean, just like that, that soothing, alternative driving guitar. It just... It hits all the right notes. It's uh, it's everything that I like in music. Oh, yeah. No, it's like the heavy is that kind of like bottom drops out of the riff sort of heavy where it's just you're just you're you're slow nodding your way through it. You know, just like like I could I could imagine like you're you're, you're not head banging. You're you're hip banging like you're 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 swaying from like deeper in the body, <laughs> you know, because it's like this is more droned out sort of like. So it just it's like a bigger pendulum. It's a bigger swing. Uh, but I, I, I love that you're sending it to people because I've done the same thing. Like I've sent it to a bunch of people, and and, and it's it's like interesting because I'll get excited about bands and send people stuff, and then you just won't hear back from it. And I haven't heard back from people. I'm just like, you haven't listened to this yet because it's like I know it's going to hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm revisit those text messages and be like. Yo, did you listen to I'm going to be that annoying guy to be like, I sent you this band and I never heard back from you. So I'm going to need you to listen. <laughs> yeah, for you're going to hate what you've done. It's almost like I need a follow up. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, you really need to listen to that song and then tell me what you think. Yeah, they have like, there's like, oh, you know what I love about that song? Well, all of it, A, 
like <laughs> but then when it when it like when it drops it like not to give it away but it drops in pretty fucking heavy you know yeah. like you know hip sway full on you know full body bang and then they do three guitar solos <laughs> and they're so good and it's like yeah, it really is. It's it's so big and noisy, and it's like the way I want to hear guitar solos. It's not like these. It's not tech, you know. It's just like gritty, and I don't know. It explodes. Yeah, I love it. And I saw them live recently. They're on tour with Foxing right now. They've got a couple weeks left in the tour, mostly on the West Coast. So, uh, to our West Coast listeners, go check them out if you have the opportunity. I went to see them and it wasn't quite what I expected. I I almost expected like a quieter, kind of moodier thing based on the new EP, but it was an explosive rock and roll experience that only made me like the band about 20 times more. You know, just these waves of guitar hitting you. It just, it kind of reminded me of hum, like a hum vibe if you've ever seen them. And obviously if you've heard them, really awesome. And I had the chance to say hi to Sam and tell him that uh, he actually inspired me, Josh, because in the conversation, you heard us talk about Twitch for a while. And I was on the fence for a long time about putting gaming content out there because, you know, self-conscious about it. And, oh, what if no one likes it? And blah, 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 blah. But I finally did it and launched a couple pages and put some videos out there. And that was based on the conversation I had with Sam. So thank you, Sam. You you got me motivated and now I'm doing it. I loved his take on that as well. It's just like a being like, like accept where you are right now in it. Like you're not going to be good at it overnight, you know, unless you're just some like absolute virtuoso of, of whatever. And it, and he's right. And that goes to gaming. That goes to the skill of podcasting that you've been doing. You're right. That goes to the skill of twitching. It's, You've got to put in the work. Yeah, that was an important part of the conversation. And I think important advice for anyone starting anything. And that's what I realized because I see all these polished gaming videos from people that have been doing it for 15 years. And I'm like, why would you expect that you're going to start there? And you already have experience. Like you've done the podcast. You go back and listen to the first 10 episodes and you see where you are now compared to where you've been, you you have to go through the process, just like Sam and I were talking about. Yeah, yeah. And it so applies to the way they're talking about their songs and the different iterations of the band that they had and like all the, like they had a jam band <laughs> like fa- phase of their band, which is like, dude, I love that he like, he's like, oh, there were dark years. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed at that. hilarious. Yeah. But, but like they went through it, but it was all, it was all good work. It all helped refine and, and, and just kind of cauterize with the thing that they were, they didn't even know that they were going for at the time, but it's like they put it in the work and it, and it came out and it, you know, it was different than what they thought when they were going into it at freaking 12, listening to Blink-182, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm not hating on. I, dude, I love that record. That self-titled record is Stockholm Syndrome, man. I love that song. Oh, yeah. I, that song is I feel like amazing. I've talked about Blink with a lot of guests recently, but the run of Enema to self-titled is amazing. And I even listened to Neighborhoods recently. Oh, that's and a good the song, record. The song After Midnight from Neighborhoods, incredible. But good album, too. So, yes, uh, excellent conversation, excellent band. Thank you, Sam, for coming on the show. It was great. It was great. So, Josh, I want to talk about you now. Hope's Fall just played I Matter Festival in New York. And this was a full satellite year set. And I have some questions. But first, I want to say, you know, I knew we were going to record this episode and I knew you played this fest. And so I got into like a little bit of a satellite years thing. And I went on YouTube and I was like, oh, Redshift is such a great song from the satellite years. And I, you told me that you had never played this live and this fest would be the first time. And I like that song so much because listening to it instantly transports me back to 2002. I remember coming off of that tour with This Day Forward, and you guys were on the leg of that as well. Yep. And just being home, and it's fall, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and I don't know if I'm going to get a job. And and just listening to that song instantly puts me there, and I can feel those feelings again, which is cool. So 
I listened to Redshift, and this is the, I guess, the greatness and not greatness of technology. There was already a video of you guys playing Redshift <laughs> at the fest on YouTube. Yeah. And I watched that as well. Well, I really, it, it's so funny. Uh, it's so funny that like Redshift, because we were like, oh God, what the hell are we going to do with this? And, and then we all like collectively agreed after the show. I was like, we should do that again. <laughs> I was like, that part was really fun to play. It just was like a nice big spacey thing. And, and like Chad's bass tone, it was Chad's, you know, the, he's the tone bro. Uh, he, he, he's, he's like the tone maestro. And, uh, like he, I mean, he helps me build tones and stuff like he, Chad is, doesn't get enough credit for what his input into hopes fall is, but, um, yeah, we're definitely going to play that song again. Cause it was fun to play. Good. And do it live. Yeah. And it's also funny because it's like that song, like people text me all the time. It's just like, dude, I just heard Redshift on NPR. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's awesome. All the time. Like somebody at NPR likes us and I'm grateful. I love that. I love that. So the satellite year set at iMatter Festival, it, uh, was it all? It wasn't all in order, right? No, we played it straight through, start to finish. Oh, really? Yeah, just start to finish. Wow. Yeah, that must have been incredible. Yeah, we've never done an album playthrough ever, and we were just like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna do this. It's uh, it, it's twenty. I mean, we put out. It, it, this makes me feel old. We put that record out twenty years ago this year. Yeah. So I was like, all right, this seems substantial enough to like, that's what we'll do for our set for, you know, some upcoming shows. It's been 20 years of the record that kind of put, basically put us on the map. So yeah. let's, let's just play it start to finish. We've never done that before. And uh, I enjoyed doing it. That's great. I saw on Instagram that you busted out the tent from Warp Tour as well. Oh yeah, dude. We like that, that tent's got a, a storied history. Uh, it like it lived for with our bass player Mikey for years, and he would go to shows and sporting events where he was tailgating, and just bring that tent and set it up. <laughs> <laughs> and so he and I went to Pearl Jam back in like I don't know 2009 or something together, and like tailgated all day before a show. And I spent like the vast majority of the the Pearl Jam show in line for beer. This is like, as soon as I, as I was already like too drunk to, to, to just function. And I was just like, I just need more beers. And so I just stayed in the beer line the whole time and I'd bring him a beer. And by the time I got him, his beer, I was done with mine. So I'd go back and get another one. So he watched the show and I was the beer runner and <laughs> there was that tent. That's what I know. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was surprised you held on to the tent for that long. I was curious like where it was, who had it. Yeah. He had it. Yeah. He had it in his basement and he would use it for things like that. Cause when the band broke up, we were like, all right, Michael used this the most. And he did. And, and so then, he, <laughs> then, then like at one point I, I was like, dude, we're, we're actually doing stuff again. I need that tent back. Like I have no idea. And we forgot it for furnace fest last year. So instead of having like a proper setup, like we had it with us and left it in the practice space. <laughs> we just literally forgot to load it in the van and uh, which is an epic fail. And there was like seven people there, like loading, the van. <laughs> you know, everyone missed it because it wasn't a piece of music equipment. We were like, all right, dummy check. And um, so this was the first time that we actually got to use it. And it was the first thing we loaded into the van. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that feeling though. I got like a thousand. This was back when the podcast was the Northeast scene. I got like a thousand Northeast scene business cards printed to bring to Furnace Fest, you know, so I could hand them out to potential guests and everything. Forgot them all. Okay. So you get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But hey, things worked out. So it's fine. It did. So what's coming up for Hope's Fall? And is there anything we can announce? Is there any other music out there? Is there plans for music out there? Lay it on us, Josh. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you uh, that, yes, there is going to be a new EP next year <gasps> at Ooh. some point. I don't Excellent. know the timing on that yet. That That is yet to be decided, but we will have a new EP out next year. 
Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm, hey, I'm just happy the band is together writing music, releasing music, and some of the best music of the band's career. And Josh, I told you all this stuff already the first time you were on the show, but just, you know, coming out of my drug coma, reconnecting with the band, hearing the albums that I missed, and then right at that same time, the band announces Arbiter. It was just like everything aligning, and it was a it was a really cool time, dude. I love that. I love that that hit you at the right time because it's uh, I don't know. We spent so many years doing it. I mean, we discussed that before, but like we spent years putting that thing together and never thought the project would see the light of day. So to hear that it was impactful, it, you know, is it, it that, that doesn't get old, and I'm appreciative and grateful to hear it. Yeah, and you know, I love all the band's records, but. You know, sometimes you can see people being like, oh, I don't like this one or I don't like that one. But it, the general consensus from the limited exposure I have to the general public online, everyone seems to be in agreement that Arbiter is good. Do you find the same thing? We the, we overwhelmingly positive response to it. And, you know, we knew that we liked it and felt confident in it, but it has been such a... Um, I don't know. It's been a lot of wind in our sails to hear that exactly that that it that that it was received as like even this weekend when we were playing the show, like the kids that came up and talked to us were like, "It's like y'all didn't even go away. You didn't miss a beat. Like you were doing exactly what you do, and it felt like a perfect progression." And we were just all overwhelming. I, it's like I've already used the word grateful, but it's like I, I can't I can't help but coming back to that. It's like it, the best part of getting to be in a band is creating something. And just to have it accepted and and to continue to have the opportunities after such a long absence is, it's a thrilling thing. Yeah. I mean, think about all those years you weren't doing the band and you were involved with other things. Did you ever imagine that all these years later, you'd be back with a killer record, playing Furnace Fest, playing I Matter Fest, doing all these things? No. No. No, we really <laughs> didn't. <laughs> we thought, uh, it's amazing that some labels willing to, that EV is some label, they're the equal visions, like willing to even give us the time of day. And we jumped on the opportunity and it's just been, it's, it's, it has been really nice. It's been very validating. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to more, but Josh, how are you doing personally? Josh Brigham, the man, the person the human being. I've got no complaints, man. I've been, uh, you know, grinding away at the, at the, uh, at the foundation trading stuff that that I've been doing that we've discussed before on the podcast. And, uh, it's all going in the right direction. And I, I love what I do at this point in my life. And that's a, that's a fun thing to get to say. Yes. Yes. I have the same feeling, you know, um, my day job is going great. And then all the other time I put into the podcast and all that stuff. So it's a great balance. I can afford my life, uh, my expensive life here in New York City. I- I'm just happy. I'm just happy. I'm happy to hear it. And I'm happy that you get to pursue your interest and like turn your hobby into something that is a valid point of of, of, of creation that where you're, you're making content that people are eagerly awaiting and happy to hear and you're introducing bands to the world and at least our world or or whatever. I don't know how you would want to say that, but it's like, no, let's say the world, the world, the whole (laughs) world, the whole world is listening to the new scene and they should, and they should go buy merch at death wish. You know, technically, (laughs) technically the whole world is listening to the new scene. I counted up all the countries that were heard in. I think it's somewhere around 65. Heck yeah, dude. That's amazing. Yes. That's so cool. (laughs) <laughs> it's a it's a nice surprise and to our listeners i'm not going to go on about myself too long i promise but it's a nice surprise that this thing that started very organically turned into this now because that's what i wanted my whole life was a creative pursuit that i could put everything into and wouldn't be taken away because someone quit a band or i was a mess or whatever else so i'm living the dream right now josh i'm living the dream i feel you dude and i'm pumped for you and like glad to be aligned with you in in like in the in the strange way that we'd never met before but then got connected (laughs) and and felt like we hit it off and known each other you know forever and ever and um it's just 
yeah, it just feels really positive, and I'm I'm thrilled to 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 get to be a part of your story. Yeah, same here. You know, I never imagined I'd be talking to you, Josh. Now, uh, August, what is it? August first at nine oh two p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither, man. <laughs> yeah. So you're still going to Furnace Fest again this year, right? Dude, I always go. Ah, I hate saying this. But I don't. I don't think I'm going to be able to do to go. Oh, yeah. Well, breaking news, folks. No, don't say that. Breaking like that. news. Josh <laughs> is not going to Furnace Fest. <laughs> he will not be there. there if you were expecting no, him, it's it's done. It's that, not happening, dude. No, I've got. I've got. Well, I don't know how to say this. Like, no, I've just. I've got to work. <laughs> I, I get you. Yeah. It's just like one of those things where it's like, I can't take off um, from some of the classes that I teach because I'll be taking off for uh, uh, like a different vacation. And, yeah. and I just don't have enough people to cover for me yet. I'm just not there yet. I haven't grown the brand of foundation training enough in Charlotte yet that I could get full coverage. No, that's understandable. When you run your own business, you, there, if you don't have coverage, like there is no off. You can't like request PTO. You know, like with the podcast, I can't not do the podcast next week and have someone else sit in and put out the episode. Like that doesn't happen. Right, right. It's the weird thing about being like a, a small business owner or entrepreneur, and and I, I can't even. It's weird to even say those words thinking about it. It's just like I do the thing that I love, and I'm excited to do that. And it's worth sacrificing for. And sometimes I don't get to do the things I want to do, but I fully think that over time that it will be worth it. Of course. You know? Yes. Because the passion is there. The demand is there. And it, it has to work. It just has to. It has to. I'm yes. willing it to happen. <laughs> we're, we're putting the vibes out there into the universe and they will happen. Because as we know, each member of Hope's Fall is intimately connected with the universe you know the whole space thing and all that big time big time connections there you know yes yeah big time connections well josh <laughs> uh this has been great thank you for sitting in on yet another episode of the new scene happy to do it man and thank you for introducing me to greet death like definitely gonna be one of my favorite albums that i've listened to this year and uh can't recommend it to the audience enough like you guys got to go and listen to new hell and you got to go listen to their new ep yes it's on the new scene spotify 2022 playlist i put two excellent songs great starting point so go check it out and hey we're back next week with a new episode and a new guest so thanks everybody for listening and until next time